Hello, uh, my name is Edra Zavala. I'm an MRC Fellow at the University of Birmingham and I'm part of the Center for Systems Modeling and Quantitative Biomedicine and the Institute of Metabolism and Systems Research. And I'm going to talk to you about our recent work modeling the dynamic cross-regulation between the stress and reproductive access. Now, before talking about cross-regulation, we need to understand the dynamic regulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the endocrine axis mediating the stress response. This axis receives circadian and stress inputs via the hypothalamus, which secretes CRH and ABP neuropeptides to the pituitary gland. And CRH and ABP stimulate corticotroph cells, which respond by secreting ACTH. And ACTH travels down the bloodstream and stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, which then reaches all tissues in the body, including the pituitary and hypothalamus, where it inhibits the activity of the axis. And a mathematical modeling combined with experimental physiology has shown how this negative feedback control is responsible for the observed ultradian or near hourly pulsatility of ACTH and cortisol, and how intraadrenal feedback loops can modulate the system response to stressors. On the other hand, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis has a similar structure except that GnRH secreting neurons in the hypothalamus stimulate pituitary gonadotrophs to secrete LH and FSH hormones, and these in turn stimulate the gonads to produce sex steroids, which can also feed back to the pituitary and the brain. One notable difference between the HPA and HPG axis is that the HPG axis has a hypothalamic pulse generator underpinning the ultradian pulsatility of LH and FSH hormones. And this pulse generator consists of GnRH neurons with firing activity modulated by kispeptin, uh, neurokinin B, and dynorphin secreting neurons, or uh, the candy neurons for short. And a recent work by Margaritis Boliotis et al has shown how a coarse grain mathematical model of the candy network can reproduce the pulse generator activity. Now, the motivation behind this project was to understand a series of experiments from different groups illustrating the dynamic effects of sex hormones on the stress axis and of stress hormones on the reproductive axis. And these figures show how circadian corticosterone rhythms in female rats decrease in amplitude following ovariectomy and how this effect can be reversed by supplementing rats with an estradiol implant. Another series of experiments in mice showed how a transient restrained stress can slow down and even stop LH pulsatility altogether. And more recent experiments show how a similar effect can be elicited by chronic corticosterone in mice. And I'll go back to these figures later on. Uh, to make sense of these results, we started with a physiological model of the HPA and HPG axis and translated it into a network model of coupled oscillators. These oscillators were the cord rhythm, the estrocycle, and the hypothalamic pulse generator with the candy network at its core. Um, we postulated coupling interactions between these oscillators based on the literature, including external forcing due to the circadian drive and stressors. And this network model was, in turn, represented mathematically as a set of ordinary differential equations. The details of the mathematical model can be found in the paper, but for now it's enough to clarify that instead of accounting for hormone concentrations, the model is representing the properties of these oscillators, such as their phase, frequency, and amplitude. And then we perform computer simulations of the model to calibrate its parameters and make predictions about in vivo experiments and physiopathological scenarios. We started by simulating normal physiological rhythms in the rat, and before showing you the results, here's just a reminder of the differences between rats and humans. Uh, not only rats are nocturnal animals and have an estrous cycle lasting between four to five days, but also their sex hormone dynamics is slightly different. So we focus our analysis around experiments in the rat and use the model to reproduce 
the circadian and ultradian rhythms of chords, as well as the pulse generator activity. So note that the pulse generator activity here, which is shown in blue, is normalized because we are only interested in its frequency. And uh, these functions, these mathematical functions here, were just used to represent our assumptions of a circadian hypothalamic drive, an asymmetric estradiol phase, and a bell-shaped response of LH to the pulse generator frequency. Next, we use the model to predict the effects of ovariectomy and their reversal by estradiol implants. We did this by simulating the loss of estrous rhythmicity caused by ovariectomy, which in our model affects both the candine network and the amplitude of the estrous cycle itself. So our model predicts about a 70% decrease in the circadian amplitude of cord and a sustained high frequency of the pulse generator, which is as if the pulse generator remains stuck in the diestrous phase of the cycle. When we simulated estradiol replacement via an implant, our model showed how cord levels recover their normal physiological dynamics while the pulse generator activity show but only a tiny reduction in its frequency. Next, we wanted to see if our model could reproduce a recent result where chronic cord exposure suppress LH pulsatility only in ovariectomized mice with an estradiol implant. And to do this, we simulated the effects of constant high levels of cord over two days in ovariectomized mice and found that the model predicted no change in the pulse generator frequency. However, when we simulated uh, estradiol supplementation in the ovariectomy scenario, the model predicted a drop in the pulse generator frequency, which was consistent with what was observed experimentally. Next, we wanted to test the effects of acute stress on the estro cycle. Now, while the LH recordings in these experiments last but only a few hours, we can perform computer simulations that last as long as we want. So what we did was to mathematically model an acute stressor as the product of two heaviside functions uh, that affect the phase and the amplitude of the chord rhythm, as well as the frequency of the pulse generation uh, via the candy network. Then we performed repeated simulations of this acute stressor given at different time points across the estro cycle. And we found that if the stressor arrived at the nadir of the circadian cord rhythm, the suppression of pulse generator frequency was minimal. Whereas if it arrived at the circadian peak, then the compounded effect of elevated cord levels would temporarily shut down the pulse generator. And by sweeping the entire estro cycle with acute stressors, we were able to build response curves for both the cord amplitude and the pulse generator frequency following a stressor. And interestingly, we also found that there is a region right between the diestrous and proestrous phase of the cycle where acute stressors seem to cause no change whatsoever on the pulse generator frequency. So we interpret this as a region of dynamic robustness where the estro cycle becomes resilient to acute stressors uh, perhaps as a mechanism to ensure that ovulation takes place. And we also calculated how the balance of inhibitory and excitatory signals in the candy network guarantees pulsatility and how this balance becomes fragile under acute stress. Lastly, we wanted to see whether the model could predict results similar to a study in women where hydrocortisone supplementation reduced LH frequency. And to do this, we simply simulated the scenario of pathologically high levels of cord. And surprisingly, the model predicted that the pulse generator will retain a very similar dynamics than in the normal physiological scenario, except that the cycle phase will be advanced by approximately 21% the total cycle length. Or in other words, the model predicts that under excess cord, the onset of ovulation will be delayed and not only that, but the region of robustness to acute stressors was shortened by a similar amount, meaning that the excess cord will overall make the estrous cycle more fragile to stressors. Now, with the caveat that our model was developed for rodents, we think that a next generation model developed for humans could explore the question of how excess cord could induce amenorrhea or delays in the menstrual cycle in women. 
And finally, I just want to emphasize that also this work was only a theoretical development. It still required of a multidisciplinary effort combining the expertise of endocrinologists, physiologists, and mathematicians working together to piece apart this complex endocrine axis. And I also want to thank the CITCON funding awarded by SNQB as well as the research councils that supported us along the way. And thank you very much and I'll be happy to take any questions.